joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And to heaven and heaven and nature. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. For as the curse is found, for as, for as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. Good morning. If you're watching this this morning, I can probably safely assume that you're in your own home, you're with family, maybe some friends, and you're just starting the day that is Christmas Day. Perhaps you're relaxing in front of a, a roaring aircon. Uh, not great weather for a fire this time of year. Maybe you're busy with Christmas lunch preparation. Maybe with your kids or grandkids and you've begun to open presents. I know that for young children, no matter how much you talk to them about the reason for the season and what Christmas actually means, almost all of them will, in the lead up to Christmas, during the Advent period, anticipate one thing, that is presents. For those of you who don't know, the tradition of gift giving at Christmas time is actually believed to have originated from good old Saint Nicholas, Bishop of Myra, and that was in the fourth century. And he was known for being a very generous man, uh, both publicly in the, the giving of gifts to kids. They used to have a, a Christmas festival that would start on December the 6th and continue all the way to January the 6th. And so he would give presents to children on December the 6th. So he was known for you know, his public expression of generosity, but he's also known for his uh, private giving, which subsequently became public, how he would throw bags of coins, in fact, bags of gold, in through a window of an impoverished family's house so that the family could not only survive, but the, the daughters who lived in the house could be married as well. So this kind and zealous man, this uh, lover of God, really kind of morphed over the years into the idea that we have now of Santa. And it was actually uh, Thomas Nast in the 1800s who designed Santa's you know, red coat and his boots and gave us that picture that we have today of, of St. Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra. But what's interesting is, and I think you and I probably agree with many scholars, is that the tradition of gift giving actually began way before this. In fact, the first example we have of gift giving is actually from the wise men. Now, I think most people will be very familiar with the wise men. The idea of these three 
oddly dressed individuals following a star and bringing gifts to baby Jesus. And that's something that's very well known to us and many others around the world. And we talk about the wise men and we say they were wise, wise men. You know, what's interesting is the word wise men that we read in the Bible comes from the Greek word magi. And that means an astrologer, particularly someone who has come from the Orient. And so we sing songs about these men, you know, we three kings of Orient are. And we get this idea that maybe they were kings based on Isaiah 60, 1 to 6, where there's this prophecy about obviously the coming birth of Christ. But more importantly, he refers to the kings coming to the brightness of Christ rising, coming to bring gifts of gold and frankincense. Now we are told that there are three gifts, but we're not actually told the number of magi or, or number of wise men. We just infer that based on the number of gifts. There could have been many more. Um, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy talks about maybe this idea that there was 10 or 12 of them. Um, maybe some turned up without presence for Jesus, but we know that uh, there were three gifts given and that there was more than one uh, wise men. In Matthew 2, 9 to 12, we actually read about these wise men. Allow me to read that to us today. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And so we pick up this passage where the wise men have just been to King Herod and they're asking him, hey, where is this newborn king? Please tell us so that we can, we can go and find him. We've been following this star. And obviously uh, King Herod was looking for this king, but for nefarious purposes. And so he says to these wise men, yep, when you go and find this king, come back on your way home and tell me so I can too go and worship, which was not in his heart to do. But this is where we pick up the story. The wise men have followed the star. They've seen where it rests and they have found Jesus. And scholars say that this journey that the wise men took potentially could have taken them a few years. And so maybe Jesus at this point was you know, two to three years old. He could have very well been a toddler at this point, but they present to the newborn king. The first example of Christmas gift giving. Three gifts given to the newborn, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We understand gold, I think, all of us in this day and age, and we often mispronounce frankincense and, and you know you'll hear kids all the time call it Frankenstein and myrrh I think most of people most of us really have no idea kind of what myrrh is we're like oh yep it was one of the gifts um, but thinking about these three even what little we know you know surely there's more appropriate gifts that you'd give a baby or that you would give a toddler but what if I told you that each one of these gifts carried great significance what if I told you that these gifts were significant for us today? So the first gift that was given, it was gold. And in biblical times, and in fact throughout history, and even today, gold was always considered to be one of the most precious of metals. It signified wealth, it signified royalty and nobility. It was the possession of kings. Right? You didn't just see um, any odd person walking around with, with gold. Rather, you know, it was reserved for those who were royally born. The gift of gold given by the wise men symbolized that the baby before them was more than met the eye. Despite the humble circumstances of his birth, the wise men recognized him for what he was, the King of Kings Church. And I want to tell you this morning, we often talk about Saviour, but he is more than just a saviour church. He is the rightful king of the universe and should be the lord of our lives. 
And the question that each one of us has to ask ourselves today is, will we submit to his sovereign rule? The rule of a loving and a just and a gracious and a merciful king. A king who knows what's best for us. Or will we instead seek to be the Lord of our own life? The second gift was frankincense. Now frankincense was a very, very expensive incense. And I've never actually smelt it, but I'm told that it smelt amazing. And it was actually reserved for occasions of great significance. In the Old Testament, we see it being used in a temple for offerings. Um, we read this in the book of Leviticus. And we see it being used in weddings. Um, we see that in the Song of Solomon and in royal processions as well. It was also used by the priests in worship. And it was actually stored in a special place out the front of the temple. It was considered by all of those in biblical times and times after to be the incense of a deity. You see, the gift of frankincense was more than just some nice smelling incense, um, you know, that, that, that was given for the family because, hey, you know what, born in a manger, this place probably smells. I mean, we don't know where they were at the time, but you know, it was more than just a, a fancy air freshener given to Mary and Joseph and to Jesus, right? It was a gift given that recognized Christ's deity and the worship that he was due. The presentation of frankincense acknowledges Jesus, not merely as earthly king, like the, the, the gold did that pointed towards him being king and Lord, but the frankincense pointed towards him as divine son of God, worthy of adoration and worship. And what's amazing is in this act, we glimpse the depth of Christ's identity intertwined with his royal authority and his divine essence. And we would ask ourselves today, do we recognize him as God? God who is worthy of our worship, worthy of all that we are, given for all that he is. Or will we choose to worship ourselves this Christmas church and the third and final gift that we read about in Matthew is the gift of myrrh now myrrh was a type of perfume and it certainly wasn't as expensive as frankincense but it still held significant value you see when myrrh was mixed with wine it could be used as an anesthetic or as pain relief um, and when it was mixed with other spices it was used very commonly for the preparation of bodies for burial it was even used in the preparation of jesus body for burial we read that in the gospel you see myrrh represented his humanity myrrh represented his coming death i know that sounds like a an odd gift to give especially to a baby or a toddler, but it was significant. You see, the presence of myrrh amongst the gifts foreshadows the sacrificial purpose of Jesus' life, pointing towards his ultimate offering on the cross. And we talked last week about how he didn't just stay baby Jesus in the manger. Rather, he grew up fully God, fully man. He taught us how to live and lived himself a perfect life. He suffered and was crucified for our sins and our iniquities and our transgressions. And we need to remember, need to remember church this morning that his death was not on a whim, but rather since the beginning of time, it was ordained that he would come to this earth to save us from the power and the penalty and the presence one day of sin. Today, I think, Undoubtedly, most people watching this will be invo involved with some sort of um, present giving or present receiving. But I would ask us all today to take some time, even now, even after this message, to reflect on the gifts that were given to Jesus. Gifts that signified his royalty, his deity, and his humanity, his future death on a cross for our sins. They were significant for him over 2,000 years ago. And I would say that they are significant for us still to this day. Do you recognize him as more than a baby? Do you recognize him as Lord and rightful king and sovereign ruler of your life? Do you recognize him as God 
holy and wonderful, worthy to be worshipped with all that you are? Do you recognise him as saviour, the one who bore all your sin and shame on the cross at Calvary so that you could have new life and dwell in perfect communion with the Father for all eternity? He's more than a baby church. Let us remember him for who he is this morning. And as we open presents, let us reflect on the presence given to Jesus over 2,000 years ago and reflect on all that it means for us. I know you're at home this morning. You might be doing a million things whilst watching this, but please bow your heads with me and close your eyes as I pray for us today. Father, thank you that today, more than all the days in the year, we choose to remember you sending your son to this earth to be born in a manger, to be born under the most humble of circumstances. Thank you that you sent him to crush the head of the enemy, to defeat sin and death and hell, to tear the veil in two so that we are no longer separated from you, Father, a loving and holy God, but instead we could be brought back into right relationship. We could be adopted into your family. And we remember, as much as his birth is on our minds this morning, we remember Christ's death for us. We remember the gifts that were given and what they signify and what they still mean to us today and the response that they demand from our lives. I pray that each and every person watching this would be able to reflect today and say, yes, he is Lord of my life. Yes, he is the one true God who I give my everything to in worship. And yes, he came in humanity fully God but fully man to this earth to suffer and die for me he is my saviour let that be a reality for us this morning and for those maybe who are listening who this is not a reality for I pray that you would speak to them this morning that they would know your love they would know what it means to be known by you they would know that if they only turn to you in humility and repentance that you stand there with arms open and that they can know you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. This following Sunday coming, uh, we don't have a formal service. I encourage you, gather your family together, open the scriptures, have some family worship, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. You'll receive an update video in this coming week, letting you know about all of the exciting things uh, that we have to look forward to in 2024. But until then, God bless you and have a Merry Christmas. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come. Come ye to Bethlehem Come and behold Him Born the King of Angels Oh, come let us adore Him Oh, come let us adore Him Oh, come let us Adore Him, Christ the Lord God of God Light of light Lord
greet thee Born this happy morning Jesus, to thee be all glory 